Hey everyone, welcome back to Fantastic Microbes and Where to Find Them. Today we are going over ostracods. So here's my hand for reference just to show you how small these guys are. They are visible to the naked eye, but they are still pretty small. So most species are about a millimeter in size, but they can vary in length between 0.2 millimeters and 30 millimeters. Uh, this particular species is somewhere between the range of teeny and tiny. So let's take a closer look under the microscope here, and uh, let me just tell you all about them. So first of all, there are about 70,000 species of ostracods or seed shrimp that have been identified, and there are probably many more that have yet to be discovered. These individuals are scattered all over the world, and because of that, there is quite a bit of diversity. So some of these facts apply to all of them, and some apply to just a few of them. So let's go over kind of the general stuff. When these individuals are born, they will molt uh, about nine times throughout their uh, growing up period, uh, throughout their juvenile stage. Um, that period lasts about 30 days, uh, where they molt about nine times, and then most species live to be about uh, two years old. Now I want to talk about the bodies of these ostracods because there are some really cool things about them. So first of all, they have seven pairs of limbs which are used for a ton of different purposes. Uh, they're used for locomotion, for grasping onto things or each other, uh, for swimming, for cleaning, for feeding, or as sensory organs. So they use their limbs for a lot of purposes. Uh, they also have hairs that cover their body. Uh, you can kind of see them right here. And uh, those are also used for sensory purposes. It helps them uh, a lot more than their eyes usually help them. And in fact, in a lot of cases, ostracods are blind. Some of them have eyes and some of them don't. And sometimes the eye spot just takes in light. And in other cases, the, uh, the eye is like a compound eye, kind of like, a, like an insect, you know. Another thing, which you probably saw in the thumbnail, is that most ostracod species do not have a heart or circulatory system. However, they do have blood which is pretty crazy. So it basically circulates between the valves of the shell and they, you know, use their limbs and other parts of the body to kind of get that moving. And then as far as uh, the nitrogenous waste, uh, that just gets extruded through glands on the maxilla or their antenna or both. Stuff like this that blows my mind about how animals exist on a totally different set of rules, you know, when you go down to a microscopic level. So the last big thing I want to talk about as far as their body plan and function is their reproductive system. So you probably saw in the thumbnail that uh, the males have two penises. This is true uh, with most male species of ostracod. Um, this corresponds with the two uh, genital openings for the females. And so an interesting thing about ostracods is that they usually mate in groups. So I thought I was catching a, a mating opportunity here, but that that didn't really happen. Uh, it's mating usually occurs in spring, and uh, but yeah. So like I said, it occurs in groups. It's called swarming, and uh, a bunch of them all kind of hook up and connect together. Uh, so you can probably find other YouTube videos out there. Uh, just look up ostracod swarming if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, so pretty interesting. Uh, however, uh, these guys didn't show any of that off because it's not mating season. So, uh, but as far as uh, other interesting uh, reproductive facts. The males uh, in the ostracod family also have the largest sperm for their body size in the entire animal kingdom. In fact, on average, most male ostracods, uh, their sperm takes up the length of one third of their body. The longest sperm belongs to an Australian species of ostracod, and it ranges, uh, or it reaches over 11 millimeters in length, which is 3.6 times the length of the male. Now, you might be thinking, wow, these ostracod males are so overpowered with their crazy long sperms and whatnot. What do the females think about it? Well... Uh, I don't really know. However, what I do know is that there are several species of uh, ostracod that have completely done without the males. That's right, there are some species of ostracod that are female only, and the females are able to clone their bodies and reproduce completely without needing to be fertilized by the male. 
So this is something that I've brought up before in some of my other videos that, you know, there are some of a certain species that can reproduce without males and then some that need the males. Now, I don't think I've mentioned, you know, what's the pros and cons of each? Well, um, if you don't have any males uh, to help you reproduce, the pro is that you don't have to waste a lot of energy looking for a potential partner, uh, you know, swarming in, and going to the right places, you know, anything like that costs energy. Now, the con, however, is that there's less genetic diversity, which means that the species is more likely to become extinct in the long run. Now, moving on with some more reproductive facts. So let's talk about the eggs of ostracods. So most of the eggs with, with most species will be laid just in the water. Uh, however, sometimes in certain species, the females will brood and like take care of their eggs inside of her body until they're a little bit more mature and ready to hatch. Uh, and then another cool thing about the eggs is that they're extremely drought resistant, uh, which is really beneficial for small organisms like this. Um, I've probably mentioned before that uh, brine shrimp are very similar in this case. They can survive for years being dry. And then as soon as you put them in water, just give them a couple hours and they are ready to start uh, growing. Now I want to shift gears for a little bit because I forgot to mention that some ostracods are bioluminescent, meaning that they glow in the dark through a special chemical process. Now this isn't this particular species, uh, but the species that do light up are found in the Caribbean and uh, Australia and Japan, and they glow a really bright blue color. So you can probably look up uh, bioluminescent beaches or like blue sand uh, beaches and you'll find these guys. Um, so, but, and people have known about this for quite a long time. In fact, in World War II, the Japanese used, uh, the bioluminescent ostracods as a light source, which helped them read maps at night and other documents and stuff. So they would, uh, gather up the sand, gather up the ostracods and grind them into a powder. And, uh, it made for a great dim light source, which, uh, you know, wouldn't give away their position. Now, I just mentioned the Caribbean, Japan, and Australia. So that just gives you a slight glimpse as to how widely distributed these guys are. So these uh, ostracods are found in for everywhere from the sub Arctic to the tropics. And the reason that they are so widely distributed is that a lot of them hitch rides on migrating animals like birds and things like that. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, uh, getting stuck on their feathers or their, their legs on pieces of algae. But other times they are eaten and they get pooped out and they survive being eaten alive. Yep, that's right, they can be eaten alive. In fact, one study recently showed that about 26% of specimens eaten by bluegill sunfish came out the other end completely unharmed. So how are they able to survive? Well, because of their body shape, they are basically like clams, and so they have really strong muscles that can seal themselves shut. And so they'll probably just seal themselves shut while they're eaten, and then, you know, they open up once they feel like it's safe to come out. So that's the story about when these guys are eaten. However, what's the story about what these individuals eat? Well, uh, because there are so many different species, there's quite a range of diets. You know, some are filter feeders, some are scavengers, some are herbivores, and some are carnivores. And in fact, the carnivores are pretty crazy because they can attack in groups and they eat animals that are much larger than them and they can eat them alive. Usually they start off at the places that are the weakest, like the anus, or like the mouth or the eyes or the ears uh, and then they just dig their way in and uh, in a matter of minutes they can completely kill an animal like a fish that's much larger than them. So I have one more fact here and I saved it for last because I wanted this to kind of sum up the whole point of this episode and this channel as well, which is basically that these are very, very complex animals and even though they're so small, they are capable of so much. And uh, so this last fact is that these animals are able to be trained. So scientists who are able to train ostracods to follow a specific colored light source that would lead them to food. And uh, this just tells us that these individuals are capable of learning. And which is crazy because there are some single-celled organisms that are even uh, larger than some of these guys. 
I hope this gave you all an appreciation for seed shrimp. Now, these are just one of an infinite amount of other microbes, so I encourage you to look at my other videos on the channel and uh, like, subscribe, and support the Patreon as well. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time.